Alrighty, so right now I'm going to go over the gram positive cocci that you need to know for the USMLE step one. First, let's start about the two different types of them. First, you have the staphylococcus, you have the streptococcus. Remember, they're both gram positive. P is for purple. Look, I even made this purple, so you remember, gram positive is purple on a slide. Staphylococcus comes in clusters, like this. Grapes, and I circled the one part that has nothing on it. But if you look down here, you see they look in clusters, they look like grapes. This is what staph is. Staph means cluster. So whenever you see staphylococcus, look for something that has clusters that are purple. Streptococcus, on the other hand, is in a linear fashion. You see this? It's very linear, very linear. Um, this is how you distinguish between the two things in terms of a gram stain uh, microscopic slide. If you want to distinguish between a staphylococcus or a streptococcus organism, biochemically, you can use the catalase test. Catalase is an enzyme that turns hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. This is advantageous because hydrogen peroxide is toxic and can kill us. Um, when you convert it to oxygen, remember, oxygen is a gas, so it tends to bubble in the presence of water. Therefore, if you were to add hydrogen peroxide to catalase, it would form oxygen, which would bubble. Well, that's exactly what you see. Staphylococcus has catalase. Staphylococcus has catalase. It bubbles when you put hydrogen peroxide onto staphylococcus. This right here means that you put staphylococcus on this slide, you added hydrogen peroxide, and it started bubbling. On the other hand, you added hydrogen peroxide to the slide, and you killed the poor streptococcus. Nothing's going on. It's all dead. All right, now we're going to get into the specific types of staphylococcus organisms. First, S. aureus. This causes a ton of diseases. Endocarditis, osteomyelitis, scolded skin syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, food poisoning, abscesses, several skin infections, and pneumonia, anything, anything. The virulence factors, catalase. Remember, we just talked about catalase. Neutrophils use, cat, use a hydrogen peroxide to kill bacteria. Remember, catalase breaks down this hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Therefore, it limits the ability of neutrophils, neurophils, they love the brain, neutrophils to kill bacteria. Coagulase. Coagulase causes plasma to form a clot around the bacteria. When you form a clot around the bacteria, neutrophils can't gain access to the bacteria and it makes a wall. These ones in bold are the most high yield and most important. First, protein A. Protein A. Protein A. Protein A binds to antibodies, specifically IgG at the FC portion. The FC portion of the antibody is the part that causes the complement cascade to be initiated. If you block the FC portion, you cannot activate complement, and it prevents the complement immune response. This is why protein A is very important. Enterotoxin, it causes watery, non-bloody diarrhea and it acts as a super antigen. This is the only toxin that I can think of that causes diarrhea that acts as a super antigen, and it's also heat stable. Remember, if you get food poisoning from S. aureus, you're not getting it from the S. aureus itself. You're getting it from the toxin, which acts as a super antigen. As a side note, what is a super antigen? Super antigen is something that binds directly to MHC2 receptors or T helper cells to stimulate an immune response and it causes the release of IL-1, IL-2, and TNF. Toxic shock syndrome, it's supposed to say syndrome, toxin is another super antigen. Um, it acts in the same way, it overly activates the immune system and you see it in menstruating women that have tampons or patients with nasal packing to stop their bleeding. The reason is this packing acts as a harbor for S. aureus to grow on and eventually it grows and it causes, uh, it, it makes toxin and starts to release the toxin and then you get toxic shock syndrome. Exfoliatin causes scalded skin syndrome. This destroys a link between desmosomes on the skin layers and so your skin begins to peel off. I'll have a picture of this later. And alpha toxin causes necrosis of the skin and hemolysis. Alpha toxin causes symptoms that look like gas gangrene and that's because alpha toxin is also found in clostridium perfringes which causes gas green gangrene i'm sorry gas gangrene 30 percent of people are carriers of s aureus they carry it in their nose these people have an increased risk of skin infections 
5% are carriers in the vagina, which also have an increased risk of skin infections, though not as much, and they have an increased risk of toxic shock syndrome. Why? Because if you have it in your nose or you have it in your vagina, you can transfer it easily into the nasal package of the tampon and it can harbor the bacteria and grow. So specifically, what diseases do you need to know that S. aureus causes? Well, it causes skin infection and it causes a lot of skin infections. I'm not going to get into the specific types. Um, if it causes necrosis, it can be due by the alpha toxin, especially if it's in a wound, or if it's from MRSA, it can be because of this other toxin called PV leukocidin. Uh, I think this is extremely low yield and will probably not show up, but I guess who, who knows. Um, and you can pass skin infections on by close contact. It's also the primary cause of osteomyelitis. The primary cause of osteomyelitis. If something says osteomyelitis, you immediately have to think of S. aureus. Endocarditis in drug users in the tricuspid valve. The reason it's in the tricuspid valve is you inject blood into your veins, your veins then, uh, or bacteria into your veins, your veins then tend to, uh, they send the bacteria to the vena cava and then to the right atrium, and the first valve it runs into is the tricuspid valve. So there's nothing especially uh, special about the tricuspid valve that makes it harbor the bacteria. It's just the fact that it's the first valve it runs into. Um, wound infections, we just went over that with alpha toxin. Hospital acquired pneumonia, one of the most common causes. It can infect the conjunctiva, and it's the most common cause unless you're dealing with children, in which the most common cause is S. pneumonia and Haemophilus influenza. Causes food poisoning by enterotoxin, which is a super antigen, a heat stable toxin too, and it causes the diarrhea very quickly, one to eight hours after ingestion. Um, toxic shock syndrome. If a patient comes in, remember this says shock on it, it means it has the symptoms of shock. A patient will come in with fever, hypotension, sometimes they'll have a rash that looks like a sunburn. And if you see that three organs are beginning to fail, or you would see the effect on three organs, such as the liver, kidney, blood, GI tract, then you could uh, start suspecting toxic shock syndrome. Finally, scolded skin syndrome. It's mediated by exfoliatin. And in this, the skin sloughs off, and it's usually and basically always in children. And here is a picture of scolded skin syndrome. Pretty bad. How do you treat S. aureus? Well, staph in general, not just staph aureus, but staph epidermidis, saprophyticus, all these staph infections generally tend to produce beta-lactamase. The good news is that there are some penicillins that are resistant to the beta-lactamase that staph makes. These are called methicillin, oxacillin, nafcillin, cloxacillin, dicloxacillin. Anything that says psyllin, basically. Psyllin. Now, methicillin is no longer used because it had very serious side effects. But fortunately, we named S. aureus methicillin resistant S. aureus if it's resistant to this entire class of medications. Um, if the S. aureus is resistant to this class of medications, it's called methicillin resistant S. aureus or MRSA, and I'm sure everyone's heard of MRSA. And you cannot use any sort of penicillin medication because the S. aureus is resistant to it, so instead we use vancomycin. Now there's a new class of S. aureus that is resistant to methicillin and vancomycin, and I'm sure you can imagine why this would be a big problem. This is called vancomycin-resistant S. aureus, or VRSA. For this, you have to get out of the box, you have to use linezolid, streptogramins, or Bactrim, which is trimethoprin and sulfamethoxazole. Um, as a side note, if you use methicillin and your patient gets a rash, you don't have to move away from the penicillin type antibiotics, you can give a first generation cephalosporin. But now if you were to give this class of antibiotics and the patient goes into anaphylaxis, well then you're going to have to switch to a macrolide like clindamycin. Away from S. aureus now, we're going to go into Staph epidermidis and Staph saprophyticus. This is very, very easy. First, remember, coagulase negative. This is important. Why? Because this is how you distinguish these two from S. aureus. Coagulase negative. And remember, coagulase was a, uh, it's a factor that causes blood to clot and it shields the S. aureus from the immune response. S. epidermidis is hospital acquired. 
This is why it's not hospital acquired. It normally resides in our skin and it can enter our body from catheters, prosthetic joints, or anything else that's inserted into the body that's invasive, such as a, a vascular graft. And once inside the body, these can produce biofilms, which are a tremendous pain in the ass to treat. Remember, this is a staph uh, organism. Staphs generally have beta lactamases, so vancomycin. Saprophyticus is a different type of staph organism, and you suspect it if you see a young sexually active female coming in with a UTI. In this case, with young sexually active females, it's the second most common cause of a UTI, so you always have to consider this an option. The most likely cause, by the way, is E. coli. Treat this with a fluoroquinolone or Bactrim. To differentiate between the different staph organisms, you can differentiate Epidermidus and Saprophyticus from S. aureus because of coagulase. S. aureus has coagulase, these two do not. Also, you can use hemolysis. Hemolysis means that if you were to grow the bacteria on a blood auger plate, hemolysis, remember, hemo, blood, lysis, explode. S. aureus tends to make the blood explode, so on a blood auger plate, it'll be all white around the red auger. S. epidermidus and Saprophyticus don't have an effect, they just grow normally on the auger. Uh, exotoxins, S. aureus has them, these don't. Now, to distinguish between these two, you look at the auger and you add an antibiotic called Novobiosin. All right? Epidermidus is sensitive to this antibiotic, so it will not grow on the media. Saprophyticus is resistant to Novobiosin, and therefore it will grow on the media. And that's it for the staph infections. The next video will go over the strep infections.